when a new world order begins. What happens? How do we know? And what should we do? And how do we prepare ourselves when a new world order begins? Family, how you doing today? It's great to be here. Great to be alive. I'm glad you are here. Today we are talking about what occurs when a new world order begins. Just give me a sound check out there. Let me know that you can hear me pretty good if you're here live. If you're watching this on the replay, blessings. We're going to be looking at a few different passages today. Two Old Testament passages and two New Testament passages. And I'm going to show you what these two passages reveal to us about the New World Order. When the New World Order begins... What are we to expect? Let's find out. Let's pray together, shall we? Family, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for blessing this family. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us this opportunity to be here. Use us now. Guide us. Order our strength. Order our steps. Strengthen us and anoint me even as you have done before in the past. Anoint me today and refresh me anew. So I thank you and I bless your wonderful name for what you've done and what you're doing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you all so much for being here. If you haven't done so, those on the live stream, say hello to someone as we get started today. Hello from Greenland. Hi, OK Girl. Dominic, how are you? All right. And wherever you're from, just type it now in the comment sections. What do we do when a new world order begins? Okay, that's what we're talking about when the New World Order begins. We're going to look at this through two lenses. Number one, an Old Testament lens. And number two, a New Testament lens. We're looking at David and the transition of David from power, moving from life to legacy. And then we're going to look at this from the, uh, from the end times perspective as we look at the Antichrist when he comes to power. And as we look at what Jesus had to say about serving, all right? Hello, West Virginia's in the house, Eastern Washington, Michigan's in the house. Great to have you all out here today, all right? I should move relatively quickly, but please, if I'm going too fast, let me know, just say stop, I don't get it, and I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll circle back around, okay? Now, there's two ways that you know a new world order is on the cusp of beginning. Those two ways are this. You look at their relationship with God and you look at their relationship with money. God and money. That's how you know when a new world order is going to begin. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Let me, let me explain a little further. The relationship with God, if it is moving closer to him or moving away from him, that nation is getting ready for a change. Their relationship with money, if they are losing money or the money is devaluing or if that money is moving closer to, uh, to being spent on things that are necessary or it's moving further away from being spent on things that are necessary or in this case, uh, what we're talking about is demonic activity then that nation is on the cusp of a new world order. I'll explain this a little bit more as we get into the passage. But one of the things you're going to find out is that these two passages are extremely relevant for what we are going through now. Let me read the passage, and then we're going to get into it a little further, shall we? <clears throat> We're going to begin with this passage here in the New Testament. And then I'll go back to the Old Testament and show you how they tie up together. Okay. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 24. Matthew 6, verse 24. That's our first passage. Type that in the comment section if you wouldn't mind. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Jesus says this. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, 
or else he will hold to one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is another word for money. Okay. So the next thing I want you to type in the comment section is this. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. You can't serve two masters. Jesus tells us right from the beginning, no man can serve two masters. Your relationship with God and your relationship with money have to be correct. He does not tell us that you cannot have money and love God. That's not the, that's not truth. But what he does tell us is that you cannot serve money or mammon and serve God. In other words, you can't worship your pocketbook or your bank account or you cannot worship the quest for money. Instead, your worship should solely be devoted to God. If you follow what I'm saying so far, give me a thumbs up. So Jesus says in our first passage that you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and money. Okay, let's go to the, the second passage of the New Testament. And again, we're talking about when a new world order begins. The second passage we're going to look at comes from Revelation chapter number 13, verse number 16. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 16. And I promise you, I'm going to tie all this up so you won't be left uh, with a question about where we're headed. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 16 says, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name or the number of his name. Here's the second thing I want you to type in the comment section. For those who are just reading the comments, type this. Revelation 6, uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 equals the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 16 equals the mark of the beast. Now, with this particular passage is at the end of days when the Antichrist has come into power. The passage lets us know that by the time he gets here, nobody will be able to buy or sell unless they take the mark of the beast. When you have money, you use the money for what? Buying and selling. Money is a placeholder that is supposed to signify the value of something larger than what you have. Here's a little brief uh, lesson in economics, all right? Those uh, who um, are in college or high school or just interested in it. Money is, is a placeholder for the amount of goods that you have. It could be anything. It could be a you. It could be a yen, it could be a dollar, it could be a peso. It's just a placeholder for the value of goods that you have. And in, uh, and in our case here in America, it used to be a placeholder for the amount of gold that we have. Okay, Whenever you get a chance, look that up uh, and see what we did with that back in 1971 when we took the dollar off the gold standard. Why am I explaining this? In this way, the Antichrist comes onto the scene. He is going to make it abundantly clear that you have to worship him in order to buy or sell. You follow me so far? 
Jesus told us in the book of Matthew that no man can serve two masters. So Jesus is almost foreshadowing what, or excuse me, not foreshadowing. Sorry about that. That's the wrong word. Jesus is already telling you what's going to happen. Uh, he's telling you in different words that there will be a time when people will show or have to show who they are worshiping. They worship God, worship money. The Antichrist tells you that if you are to worship me and will at this point in time, when he gets to Revelation, when we get to Revelation, he says, you will. That this is what's going to happen. You're going to have to take my mark. And if you don't take his mark, you're going to die. So the connection between Matthew Revelation is this. A new world order has begun when someone comes into power that takes over the money system. I'll say it again. When someone comes into power that takes over the monetary or money system, that's a symbol of the new world order or a world order taking place. So, how do we know when a new world order is taking place? Remember? their relationship with God and their relationship with money. Jesus tells us you can't serve two. When we get to Revelation, we know Antichrist is forcing you to serve one. So then that brings me to us right now this generation I have a question what is this generation of people serving what does this world serve right now what does this world of value or esteem what does this world worship comment section do we worship God more than anything? Or do we worship money, the placeholder for goods? We worship money. What has this world been trained to worship? Yes, I see the answers already. They're trained to worship money. Why are we taking this route? What what are we what are we doing? Why why are we going this direction? See, I started with the New Testament and I showed you these two passages to prove to you that there is one of two ways that a person can worship. One of two beings a person can worship. They can worship God or they can want money. And I also showed you that you can worship or will worship at a point in time the Antichrist. I also showed you the placeholder. What's going to happen, Erica? What's going to happen, Janika? What's going to happen, Lemieux, is this. The placeholder is going to be removed. We're not going to have no, no more placeholders, no, no more paper dollars at this point in time. All you're going to have is a mark. Once the placeholder is removed, you'll be able to see clearer who is worshipped. Are you following what I'm saying? We're in an era of time right now where the placeholder is being removed. I'll give you some time to think about that. We're in an era of time right now where all of the placeholders are removed. It sounds like it's scary. 
Jericho, but it's really not. It's really, it's really a sounding call. It's really a sounding board or a trumpet that's getting ready to blow to let you know that we're going to be out of here. We're in a place where the monetary system is being destroyed so that we can move to the antichrist monetary system of worship when a new world order begins you look at the relationship with god and the relationship with money why is the monetary system being destroyed so that we can get to the book of revelation are you following what I'm saying so far? If so, give me a thumbs up. If you need me to circle back around and explain it again, I'll do. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm reading the comments now. Okay. Thumbs up. Okay, good. So you're following me so far. Check, check. Check, check, mic check, mic check. Oh, what happened? That devil's a lie. You see that? Hello, hello, check. Can you all hear me out there? Dominic, can you hear me? Okay, so I'm seeing some comments here. Okay, I'm back. Do, do you see that? Do you see how the enemy tries to attack you right when you're, you're telling the truth? I bet you I can get to a, well, listen, I'm, I'm not going to even bother with it. But I tell you this, we're going to go ahead and preach this. Even if I have to hold this phone and the Bible in one hand. All right. If you if you can hear me, just type amen. All right. That devil's a lie. Look at that. Let me put this up here. See if I can get back in the spot. Uh, mic check. All right, good, good, good. Check, check, check. Okay, we're good. Hey, Amen, you can hear me. Okay, so let me back up a little bit. Let me circle back around and get back to the passage. Okay, I'm going to move expeditiously uh, because I don't know what's going to happen. And if it cuts off again, I'll record it and post it up. All right, so here we go. So, we are we know as believers that we're going to be in the book of revelation okay some believe we're here now but we know at some point there will be the events in the book of revelation are going to come to pass we know at some point that the antichrist is going to force a worldwide system that shows who you worship and in this case that system is largely tied to money we know that The money represents who you worship. Okay, so the order. So in order to know when a new world order has taken place or is getting ready to take place, you look at their relationship with God and you look at their relationship with money. Okay, all right. Now let's move back to the Old Testament passages, and I want to show you what King David was doing in the old testament now again stay with me just for a moment and i promise i'll get you i'll tie you i tie these things up together for you all right in the book of second samuel chapter second uh, samuel chapter 21 verse number Eighteen. Second Samuel chapter 21, verse number 18. Here's what it says. And it came to pass after this, they were again in battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then. Excuse me. Then Sipachiah, the Husite, slew Saph, which was one of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines. Ilion, the son of Jerome, the Bethel, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff, whose staff was 
whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, and where a man was of great stature, uh, had one hand, six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born to a, to a giant. And when he defiled, defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Okay, that's not the passage I'm looking for, but hold on, let me go over. Uh, I'm looking for... I'm looking for the passage. Oh, I'm sorry. I started a little earlier. So yeah. So back up in that same uh, that same book, Second Samuel, chapter twenty-one. Back up to verse number fifteen. Okay. I read uh, I read a little bit further. I started further than what I wanted to. Here we go. Second Samuel, chapter twenty-one, verse fifteen. Moreover, the Philistines yet warred again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines and David waxed faint he was tired and Ish and Ishabanob which was the sons of the giant the weight who had a weight and a spear 300 shekels of brass in weight and he being girded with a new sword thought to have slain David but Abishai, the son of Zeruhai, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto them, him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that ye shall not quench the light of Israel. Okay? If you got a pencil or highlighter, circle verse 17 or highlight verse 17 of 2nd Samuel chapter 21 circle or highlight verse 17 David was told by his men you can't go out with us to fight anymore because we don't want the light of Israel to go out okay yes highlight verse 17 of chapter 2 or 2nd Samuel verse 21 okay that's important okay so in this passage David is going out to fight the giants. You thought Goliath was the only giant, but as you see, these giants are still in existence when David is fighting. If you go back and look at who David is fighting, the Philistine clan, much of them, from what we know, these are giants. Giants are descendants from Genesis chapter 6 verse 3 uh, of the Nephilim. The Nephilim are these half-human, half, human, half uh, uh, a fallen angel hybrids. Okay? These things are totally evil. Why is this important for you to understand? David and the whole regime that David was fighting in, the whole generation that David is fighting in, is a foreshadowing of the end of days in which we are living in. I'll say it again. David and his whole regime, his whole generation, is a foreshadowing of the end of days in which we are living in. How, why, why would I say that? When you read your Bible carefully, and this is what this whole channel does, by the way, we focus on connecting you to God's word. No silliness, no silly. We read the Bible. When you read the Bible, the whole Bible is tied together in one unified continuum of history. Okay? The stuff you read about in Adam and Eve affected the stuff that happened later on with King Hezekiah. The stuff that happened with King Hezekiah affected what happened to Manasseh. 
Manasseh's regime affected what happened to King Saul. King Saul's regime affected what happened to David. David's regime affected what happened when Jesus Christ came down uh, for his ministry. And what happened with Jesus Christ and his uh, earthly ministry affected what the Apostle Paul did. All through the Bible, you understand that it's all connected. And so you see from Genesis to Malachi, it points to to Christ coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John discuss some of the events as Christ was here, but from uh, uh, from the book of Acts through Revelation, it points back to Christ, but everything points to God. Christ. And you see sometimes that there are foreshadowings or preludes, pictures to what it's going to be like. So how is this a picture to what is going to happen later on? Well, David was a man after God's own heart. We know this. David was a man who had moral failures. We know this. But the thing that David had going for him is that he always knew to repent and bring his life back into proper relationship with God. Have you or will you admit that in your life personally, you have had moral failures? If that's you, just type. That's me. That's me. But even in the midst of your moral failures, you somehow knew that you need to get your life back in alignment with God. Mm -hmm. If you're somebody who knows that you have to get your life back in alignment with God, type... Yes, I've been forgiven. All of us have. All of us who are truthful with ourselves know that there is no perfect flesh. There is no perfect human being. We all are dependent upon God. David is a walking picture of what occurs when a generation of people are human they fail but they refuse to go off the continuum into obliteration because they always turn their life back to God I know that I need God I know that I've done wrong but I will never ever get to a place where I am going to, to, to just totally abandon God and believe that I don't need him, I always know that I need God. And so what David is foreshadowing for us is a man, a walking human being, the embodiment of this generation who has taken a last stand before the light goes out. Mm. Oh, I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you guys are, but whoever's out there, look up the passage where it tells us that we are the light of the earth. We're a salt of the earth. We're a light that could, somebody put that in the passage. Because I want to show you the connection. Again, this may not be the normal sermon you're used to hearing me, but if, you, if you're following me and if this is good, just, just give me a thumbs up. Let me know. Look, look what it says again. Let me, let me show it to you again. You highlighted verse number 17. <clears throat> it says, Thou shall not go no more out with us, that thou quench not the light of Israel. We do not want the light of Israel to go out. We do not want the light of Israel to go out. And I'm seeing you all type in the comment section now, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Let's go ahead and just flip over there. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. How does David signify what generation we are in now? How does he foreshadow this? Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says this. What? What happened here? Sorry, sorry, family. There it is. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. Talking, talking. This is Jesus talking. We are the salt of the earth. Um, but if the salt lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. So who does Jesus refer to us or believers as? Salt and light. Salt and light. Type that now in the comment section. We are salt and light salt and light salt and light what was david to israel david was light to israel he was light to it and you could even make the case that he was salt to israel he's the one who savored it he's the one who drew in the presence of god david was salt and light in the passage he tells us in second samuel the men tell him david you can't go out with us anymore because if, you, if you're dead, the light goes out. What does that mean for you and I? Family, we're almost ready to leave. I'm going to say this again. If, when I look at the Bible and I look at the time frame we're in, we are almost ready to be gone. I don't see any other events that need to occur. This includes the third temple. I don't know if we are aware or not of this third temple that needs to be built when the Antichrist stands up, but I'm hearing that this third temple is under construction even now, and I don't know, I don't live over there, but even that, if indeed this is true, no longer needs to come to pass. Why am I saying this? Because when the trumpet blows, and the light of the world is taken out. That's believers. When the salt of the world is taken out, that's believers. Then the new world order is ushered in totally. And there is going to be nothing but darkness and perilous times on this planet. The relationship with God and the relationship with money show you that a new world order is on the horizon. Our relationship with money now is being deteriorated and has been deteriorated. Our relationship with money is being destroyed because it has to usher in the book of Revelations where there is one currency and that currency is not going to rely on paper. It's not going to rely on coins. But that currency is going to rely on a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. Now, there are some of my brothers out there, and I need to make note of this, who say that the mark of the beast is not a literal mark, but rather a figurative one. I'm not going to explain that now. I believe it's a, a literal mark. But what I will say is, whether you believe it's a literal mark or a figurative mark, my argument remains the same. There is a time when people are going to identify that they worship God based on their actions. Are you following what I'm saying? You are going to identify that you worship the Antichrist 
based on your actions. And if you are a brother or sister who believes that it is a figurative mark, God bless you, nothing changes. You're going to know who you worship based on what you do. So when a new world order is ushered in, you look at the deterioration of the money or specifically the nation's relationship with money and the nation's relationship with God. All right. So I want you now to type in the comment section this. What are the two ways you sense a new world order? What are the two ways that you sense a new world order? Type that now. I want to make sure I'm not losing you. Yes. Mm hmm. Yeah. What are the two ways you sense a new world order? Got it. Got it. Yes. You got it. Okay. That's right. Pick up your cross daily. Mm hmm. That's right, Veronica. Yes. Got it. Yes. Okay. And I should qualify my statement by saying, what are some of the ways, what are two of the ways that you sense a new world order? Because they're not the only ways, but what are two of the ways? Yes, the currency changes to the Antichrist currency, uh, which is a mark. Okay. And the other way is you can tell the by who, who people are worshiping. Okay. All right. Now, currently in our world economy, there is an I word that's happening. It's called inflation. Okay. Again, this may sound like economics, but I want to just go ahead and educate you on this if, you, if you're not aware of it. When inflation occurs, the price of goods and, and services rapidly goes up but your ability to pay for those goods and services do not go up. So in other words, this no longer means value as it did prior to the inflation. In 1970 in America, you could buy a home for $25,000. This is an example. In 1970, in America, uh, the cost of gas was about 40 cents or so a gallon. Okay. Now, 40 cents will get you one hundredth of a tank of gas. And now $25,000 may not even be a sufficient down payment for a house. You follow what I'm saying? The price of inflation, things, goods, and services go up, but the value of the money doesn't match it. What happens when these two things go up or excuse me the inflation goes up but the money doesn't match it what happens something happens with the economy typically what occurs is the in america is the federal reserve make interest rates go up so that people stop taking out loans and borrowing it so things balance out the fed the Federal Reserve has some control over what happens. There is a point in the world economy in which America is just a part of where those items will no longer work. The Fed won't be able to raise interest rates to balance out inflation anymore. The dollar won't be as strong and is not even as strong as it was some years ago. 
So what that means is we as a world, as a global community, move away from dollar bills and have to move to another currency. Are you following what I'm saying? As believers, we know what the currency is going to be at some point in time. As believers studying our Bible, we know that that point in time is approaching rather quickly. So we have to continue to shine our light and be the salt because we know the currency is going to be the mark of the beast. The worldwide currency is going to be something in which people ultimately show who they pledge allegiance to. You follow what I'm saying? Give me a thumbs up if you do. Again, I know this sounds like an economic lesson, but it is where we are right now. Back to Bible country. And I don't even know if I have enough time to read this final passage, but what I'll do is I'll assign a little bit of homework for you, all right? Because I'm already in 40 minutes, and I think I might have gone too deep. Uh, but it just, well, let me ask you. I don't even want to insult your intelligence. Bible Talk family, listen, you've been with me for a while. I don't, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. Family, if, if I've gone too deep and you don't understand, just type, listen, I, 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 I don't understand. But if you're able to follow me and you understand what I'm talking about, just type, I'm with you. Okay? I'm not going to assume anything at all. I'll give you a moment. Okay, I see it. Thank you, Heyman. I don't understand. Okay. Thank you, Felipe. Okay, thank you, Don. Okay. I tell you what I'll do. Stay with me here for about the next eight minutes. I'm going to give you a brief snapshot. I'll give you the passages. And uh, I'll give it to you uh, uh, in cliff notes form. And you can look at it on your own. But I, I want to at least give you this last passage so you can look at it. And show you how the, world, the new world order is coming into play. Okay. Okay. Let me give you the, the last Old Testament passage. I'm going to just give it to you, okay? I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll give it to you, okay? Here it is. Kings, 1 Kings chapter 1. Now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. Wherefore his servant said unto him, Let there be sought for my lord the king a young virgin, and let her stand before the king and cherish him, and let him lie in her bosom that my lord the king may get heat. Okay, David is dying. Old age. Okay, they call in a, a young lady to come and, and, and nurse him, like a nurse. And David, you know, didn't respond to the nurse. Okay, let's fast forward down to verse number seven. And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruai, with Abathar the priest, and they followed at Adonijah and helped him. But Zodiac the priest and Benian son of J Jediah, Jedidiah, and Nathan the prophet and Shimei, Ray, and the mighty men which belonged to David were not with Adonijah. And Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle uh, by the stone of Zaluf, which is by Engroth, which and called his brethren and the sons and all the men of Judah and the servants. But Nathan the prophet and Benai and the mighty men and Solomon and his brother were called not. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to just tell you what's going to happen through Kings chapter 1. Okay, and I want you all to read that. Kings chapter 1. I'm going to type that in the comment section. Kings chapter 1. Let me tell you what happened in Kings chapter 1. When David, the light of Israel and the salt of of Israel was dying almost dead he's on his deathbed the people around him 
begin to make power plays for the throne. His sons begin to make power moves for the throne. Okay, understand this. They begin to do things that were corruptible in order to gain power. Another indication that there is a new world order is when people begin to do things that are corruptible in order to gain power. Perilous times. But, but let's keep going. When all the dust begins to settle, David in chapter number two puts Solomon in charge. He has to go through great lengths. He cannot even rest on his deathbed to do this. And when he puts Solomon in charge, he charges Solomon saying, chapter two, verse number one, now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son saying, I go the way of earth, be strong therefore and show thyself a man and keep the charge of the Lord thy God. Verse number three, highlight that. Type that now in the comment section. Keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways. Again, verse number three, 2 Kings chapter two, verse number three. Keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways. Keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways. Okay? And keep his statutes. Then he goes on later on to tell Solomon to take revenge on some people and make sure that you he gives some detailed information about who he needs to get rid of in order to protect the kingdom what what does all this have to do here's the snapshot here is the cliff notes if you just came in here's what you need to know okay today we looked at a foreshadowing of the end times we discussed what occurs when a new world order is on the horizon. What we found in the book of 2 Samuel and in the book of Kings is that 2 Samuel, people rallied around David, who was the light of the the land he was a man with flaws who sought to bring his life to god regardless of what moral failure he was in we learn from david that we have flaws but if we keep bringing our life to god god will respond We also learn from the Old Testament that David died. And when he was dying, prior to dying, chaos broke out. What I want you to know from this passage is that when a old superpower is dying, the new candidates for becoming a superpower begin to attack and make power plays for that power that's the two Old Testament passages those passages foreshadow the end times the two passages that we read three even were this Jesus tells us that we, in the book of Matthew, are salt and light. Jesus tells us as believers, we are salt and light. His salt, his light, reflective of who he is. And then he tells us that no man can serve two masters. 
You either serve God or man. Are you following what I'm saying? Then we move to the final passage, which is, <clears throat> there is a point in the book of Revelation when all the currency is going to be turned into a mark on your hand or your forehead. And that mark is going to symbolize who you serve. We are living in the days that are rapidly closing in on that time. We are living in the time frame where the mark is coming because the currency is being destroyed worldwide. It has to be destroyed so that a new currency can come in, one that a sole person controls. How do you know the new world order is on the horizon? Their relationship with God and their relationship with money. Right now, the money is being eroded. It's almost gone even. Right now, the relationship with God is being eroded. But wait. We still have believers who are in this house who are not going out without a fight. Uh, we still have saints of God who are living in the land, who are going to share with people that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. We still have a brother or sister who is willing to stand up and say, no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. We still have someone who is willing to say, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. We still have a sister, a grandmother, a grandfather who would tell you that Jesus saves. We still have a young man or a young woman who will stand up and proclaim there is a God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. If you are one of those people out there, would you type in the comment section, amen. If you're one of those people out there, who, if you, would you type in the comment section, hallelujah. If you're one of those people out there, who knows that there is an ending to this place and you know that there is going to be a point in time when it will all be done. But before we get to that point, point we are going to stand for God and be the salt and light of this world regardless of what's going on if you're one of those people that will stand for God wherever you are type in the comment section amen hallelujah and glory because we are going home soon but we're not going home without a fight Whew. thank you Lord for allowing us this opportunity to be here Lead us now, even now, Lord, as we prepare to leave. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whew. Thank you, family. Blessings to you all. Share this, like it, do all the stuff that they do on YouTube. For those who sent the comments, thank you, super chats. Please stand for God in these last and evil days. By Henry, by Elijah, Dominic, by GG, by, by Sean, blessings to you all, much love. May God be with you wherever it is you go.